Okay, hi everybody. It's Danielle Karapkin. I'm so glad to see that people have rediscovered the Shior online with webyeshiva.org. We are studying Morin of Uchim Maimonides' Guide for the Perplexed, um, and we are going to be doing today Section 3, Chapter 35. Um, the, the title that we've given for this year today is The 14 Categories of Mitzvot. Now, we are in the midst of an area of the, of the guide where the Rambam is talking about ta'ameha mitzvot, the reason why God gave us the commandments. And just to review something that is sort of the macro discussion over the last multiple chapters, is that ultimately the objective in God giving us the commandments is for our own intellectual perfection, which is defined as um, understanding God and his universe to the best of our capacity that a human mind is capable of grasping. And that is the key to immortality and to absolute human perfection. Um, each one of the 613 mitzvot, it is the thesis of the Rambam, brings us to that either directly or indirectly. Directly, if it is a mitzvah that appeals to our intellect, meaning that it, the Torah tells us to think about certain things or to believe in certain things, or indirectly, if the Torah gives us mitzvot that either are designed to pull us away from negative thoughts or behaviors that bring to negative thoughts, or if the Torah tries to engender behaviors or moral um, um, dispositions that bring us towards that ultimate uh, perfection. Um, to that intellectual perfection. So most of the mitzvahs have that indirect um, uh, objective of bringing us to that uh, intellectual perfection. And that's why you don't always necessarily see, it's not always evident when you look at the mitzvah itself. And the Rambam therefore is devoting the rest of the, almost the rest of the entire guide in section three towards that project to sort of uh, give us each and every mitzvah and break it down and share with us how each mitzvah uh, works towards that goal, either directly or indirectly. Now, in chapter 35, uh, I find this chapter to be a fascinating chapter for a number of reasons. But first and foremost is that the Rambam is beginning now his, uh, his um, explanation of Tameha mitzvot by breaking down the mitzvot into categories. Later, after having broken the mitzvot into categories in this chapter, he's then going to break down each category mitzvah by mitzvah, um, except for those that he still, uh, he honestly discloses to us that there are a few that he still hasn't fully grasped as far as why God gave us that mitzvah as it pertains to that ultimate goal that we've been discussing. However, almost every mitzvah he says, I'm going to explain to you as part of being, as being part of that project that we just mentioned. In the Pines edition, you can follow along uh, chapter 35 on page 535. And he starts off with a view to this purpose of explaining the Ta'ameha mitzvot. I have divided all of the commandments into 14 classes or what we'll call categories. Now there's something really interesting that about this number 14. Um, you know, a lot of discussion goes into, you know, the Rambam had some unique approaches. He had 13 principles of faith, but the number 14, and we don't know where that number 13 really comes from, um, but because there's no illusion in the Torah that there are 13 basic ideas that a Jew has to harbor in his heart. The Rambam comes up with this number because he believes that they are all necessary uh, parts of Jewish dogma. Um, but the number 14 is also very important to the Rambam. Take a moment to think about the Rambam's um, codification of all of Jewish law. It goes by two names. One name is Mishneh Torah, and the other one is Yad HaChazaka, as Debbie just pointed out in the, in the text. Uh, Yad HaChazaka. Now, why is it called Yad HaChazaka? That's a play on a pasuk that God took us out of Egypt with the Yad, ha Yad HaChazaka, a strong arm. But what is the word Yad in gematria? Yud Dalet is 14. And as the Rambam writes in his introdu introduction to the Mishneh Torah, he feels that there are 14 books 
that he would like to present as far as what the Mishnah Torah will be comprised of, and that in that number 14, you will find the entire corpus of the mitzvot of the Torah and how to live your life as a Jew. We have four sections of the Shulchan Aruch, that's not from the Rambam, but we have 14 books in the Mishnah Torah that contain the totality of religious practice. Now here, the Rambam is going to also give us a set of 14 categories of mitzvot. And what's fascinating is that it is a completely different method of categorization, meaning that in the Mishneh Torah, the Rambam has a way of breaking down the 613 commandments into 14 different books. And the Rambam in, in More Nevuchim also breaks down the 613 mitzvot into 14 different categories, but they're completely dissimilar. And the Rambam acknowledges this because he frequently in our chapter makes reference to his categorization system in the Mishneh Torah. So it's for that reason that I felt that there would be value in sort of lining up in two columns, the 14 books of Mishneh Torah, the 14 categories that are found in Mora Nevuchim, section three, chapter 35. And we won't be able to go through it, obviously, in a short time today to go through each and every one. But I wanted to just first break down for you what, what the system is in Mishneh Torah and then we'll go through the 14 in our chapter for today. And now the, noting that the Rambam himself realizes that this is a totally different method of categorization, I think it's important, I think that the Rambam does this with absolute deliberateness because he wants to try and underscore uh, that the uh, project of the Mishneh Torah and the project of Moreh Nevuchim are quite different from each other even though there's much overlap in that they both present the mitzvot, Mishneh Torah is a, is a work on how to, as a how-to book, how to live as a Jew. The Moreh Nevuchim is a book on Jewish philosophy in the sense that it presents a way of how a Jew is supposed to think about living life as a Jew. It's not a how-to book on sort of the, uh, the, the way to go through your life on a daily basis, but it is an instructional on what the objective is in when God gave us these mitzvot and how I'm supposed to approach it from an intellectual and philosophical standpoint. And that is the reason why the categorization system is completely different. Now, if you look at the way that, and we're going to look at the left-hand column, um, uh, these handouts that I, uh, that I uh, put on the screen every week, if you're listening to audio, you can always download it in, in the Facebook group, Shi'ur in Moren Avuchim. We always, that's why we encourage people to join it so that you can always download it. It's also available on webyeshiva.org in the course description for today's chapter, chapter 35. So there is one book that is devoted to intellectual um, ideas that a person, or what Pines translates as opinions, that a person is supposed to harbor in their heart. That is book one called Mada. All mitzvot, the Rambam writes in his introduction, and I'm just really just paraphrasing and translating the way the Rambam describes these 14 books in his introduction to Mishnah Torah. The, the book of Mada contains, that's book number one, contains all the mitzvot that comprise fundamentals of the religion of Moses and which a person must know, including God's unity and the prohibition of idolatry. And when you look through the book of Mada, you note that virtually every single uh, topic that is undertaken in the book of Mada has to do with things that I'm supposed to be harboring in my heart and in my mind. They are not really dealing with religious practice. And so the, the, even in the Mishnah Torah, the Rambam gives a nod, it gives an acknowledgement to his prioritization of the intellect over the body. Um, and he does so by saying the most important mitzvot have to do with what you harbor in your mind, in your intellect. And that's why they come as the very, very beginning of Mishnah Torah. But then let's take a look now at book number two. Ahava contains 
now mitzvot that also um, are related to mental um, ideas, I ideologies, and beliefs, and feelings, and emotions that are constant, which represent loving God, remembering him always, but they also translate into physical behavior. And therefore, the book of Ahava contains laws about reciting the Shema, prayer, tefillin, blessings, all of the things that have to do with serving God uh, through physical actions that represent my absolute devotion and love of him. And it also includes the mitzvah of circumcision, which has a certain constancy to it because it is the one part of my of the male body that if a person is completely devoid of any other external trappings of mitzvot, he always has his circumcision to remind him of this covenant that he has with God. And so you see, you've gone from completely intellectual in book one to a mix of both intellect, emotion, and action in book two. And then all of the remaining books of the Yad, of the 14 books of the Mishnah Torah, are completely pertaining to physical practice. So book number three is Manim, mitzvot that are observed periodically and are time dependent, such as Shabbat and Yom Tovim and the holidays. Book number four is Nashim, mitzvot that involve sexual contact with women, including marriage, divorce, Yibum and Chalitza, leveret marriage and leveret divorce, something that we won't go into now. Book number five is called Kiddushah, it details forbidden sexual encounters and foods. Those two go together, as we learned in a uh, in a previous chapter, in chapter 33, the Rambam had taught us that so many of the mitzvot of the Torah are designed to restrict man's physical indulgence, and he, the Rambam puts sexuality and food in the exact same category, and that's what he does in the Mishnah Torah as well. Book number six called Hafla'a, is all about mitzvot that involve verbal pledges, oaths, and vows, shvuot and indarim. Book number seven, zeraim, mitzvot involving agriculture in the land of Israel, like the Shemitah sabbatical year, Yovel, the Jubilee year, and various tithes. Book number eight is avodah, mitzvot that involve the construction of the temple and standard communal sacrifices. So the word avodah means service, it refers to service in the temple, how to build the temple, the, the, uh, how to build all of the utensils, what they are comprised of and their measurements, and uh, certain communal sacrifices that are brought on behalf of the community. Book number nine, Korbanot, are mitzvot that involve the sacrifices, the animal and flower sacrifices of the individual. Book number 10, Tahara, that is laws of ritual purity and impurity, what we would call Tahara and Tum'ah, um, involving, you know, purification, um, uh, mikvah, and the laws of the red heifer, and so forth. Book number 11, Nizikim, mitzvot between man and his fellow man, where ben adam lachavero is what we say in Hebrew, where damage is caused by one to another, either monetarily or physically, and how a person has to make restitution for those damages. Book number 12, Kinyan, that covers laws of selling and buying and transactional interchanges and relationships between human beings. Book number 13, Mishpatim, again, mitzvot between man and his fellow man, ben adam lachaviro, that are outside of the laws of damages. So therefore, it covers laws of guardianship, the laws of a shomer. It talks about debtors, claims, and denials of claims. Anytime there is a dispute between two people and they have to adjudicate their differences that's the that's in the book of mishpatim um uh, uh in book number 14 is shoftim laws that pertain to the sanhedrin to the uh, to the courts such as capital punishment accepting testimony laws of kings and their wars essentially political halacha the laws that structure society correctly by having juridical bodies and police and a monarchy. So those are the 14 books of Mishneh Torah. And as I pointed out, just to, just to repeat myself, 
Only the first book is really completely devoted exclusively to the intellect. Ahava is a combination of both the intellect and, and behaviors that manifest that intellectual um, uh, imperative. And the, 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 the final 12 books are exclusively devoted to behavioral halakha, um, how a person is supposed to, uh, and how a community is supposed to live their lives in this world in the service of God. Now let's go to the project, which is very different in Morin Nebuchim. And we'll go through, this is just really a paraphrase of chapter 35, where the Rambam says, I believe that you can divide the mitzvot based on my project in Morin Nebuchim, which is how we're supposed to think that each and every mitzvah is supposed to bring us either directly or indirectly to a complete connection with God through our intellects, we can divide the mitzvot into 14 categories. Category number one, once again, no different from the Book of Mada, fundamental ideas which inculcate correct opinions for believing in God and the Torah. It also includes repentance and fasting because those are activities or those are um, processes, I should say, that involve um, perfecting the intellect and grounding us in ideas about God. Having proper intellectual knowledge, the Rambam says, does not need to be explained. It's self-evident as to why that's necessary, because that's really the, the whole premise of Moren of Uchim. And the Rambam says, I discuss this in Hilchot Yesodei HaTorah, which is the very opening uh, uh, section of the Book of Mada. Now notice that the category number one is only a portion of the Book of Mada, because the first the first three categories really all are included in the book of Mada. So whereas the Rambam only has one book for Mada, he has three categories in Morinavuchim for what is contained in the book of Mada. Again, revealing that intellectual perfection has is plays a much larger role in the Mora than it does in the Mishnah Torah. Category number two, mitzvot that prohibit idolatry. As we explained in chapter 30 and in subsequent chapters, it is necessary to remove man from these ideas and practices in order to validate correct opinions. So there are certain things that are contained in the laws of Avodah Zarah, that are, are the laws of idolatry, that are designed exclusively, like the Rambam had said in the Mora, that are designed exclusively to pull us away from incorrect beliefs and incorrect actions, because the only way that we can arrive at perfection intellectually is if we are weaned away from those things that make us think improperly and act improperly. Okay, so included in this category are the laws of Shatnas, Orla, and Kilayim. Now, those laws, which are which respectively refer to, Shatnas refers to the prohibition of mixing wool and linen, Orla refers to the law that in the land of Israel you are not allowed to benefit from trees that have been planted within the last three years. You have to wait until they mature into the fourth year. And Kilayim is the prohibition of the Torah to mix certain plants together in the same farmland. Now, what this has to do with idolatry is not clear, but the Rambam says, when we get there, I will explain it to you. These laws are corollaries of the prohibition of idolatry because apparently in some way, this is how idolaters uh, in their agricultural practices, try to appeal to their gods by doing these pro, uh, acts of shatnas and kilayim and so forth in order to garner favor from their gods. Category number three, also from the book of Mada, are mitzvot that engender proper moral qualities. This is necessary to improve human association and society. And therefore, as you see, the Rambam is very much a proponent of making sure that society is structured properly and that people interact with each other in society correctly, because if we're constantly fighting with each other, if there's strife within society, then it's not going to be possible for the individual to attain intellectual perfection. And this is what is contained in Hilchot Deot, which is also in the book of Mada, dedicated to proper character development and how a person should comport himself as far as his moral character and how he sh how he should manifest that mo morality and dignity in his everyday life. 
Okay, next, category number four. Now we're departing from the Book of Mada. This is mitzvot that involve charity, lending, and acts of chesed, acts of kindness. Included are the laws of Erechin and Charamim, t- two different types of temple pledges, loans, the restrictions on slave ownership and how I'm supposed to act compassionately with a slave, and the laws of tithing that are contained in the in Sefer Zeraim, the book of agriculture, because that also deals with how I'm supposed to contribute of my assets, and even though I would I could save a lot of money by not doing these mitzvot that are in category number four, God specifically told us in the Torah, use your hard-earned money and then give away a significant portion of it. Except those dealing with kilayim and orla that are in category two, those are not covered in this section, even though they're part of Sefer Zeram, which deals with mitzvot having to do with agriculture of the land of Israel. Now, these mitzvot help each person appreciate the value of finance and also to more easily part from finance, because these laws are designed to make you appreciate that money is not as important as most people think it is. And that, in the way that you do that is by fulfilling mitzvot that cause you to part from your money. When I'm constantly tithing, when I'm constantly giving charity, when I'm constantly, <clears throat> excuse me, doing acts of kindness that cost me money, they, in the, in the, taken in their totality, these behaviors help, help make it easier for me to de-emphasize the acquisition of stuff, of money and the things that it buys in my life. And that is important because the only way that a person can focus on working on their intellect is if they de-emphasize the indulgences of this world, including the acquisition of goods and the making of money. Category number five, mitzvot that prohibit oppression and aggression against others as contained in Sefer Nizikin. So the the very, very practical uh, commandments to avoid harming other people. And that is important both for myself and for my neighbor. I can't, I, I can't engage in actions that are injurious to others because it, it, um, it, uh, it, it does something negative to my character. And I also can't damage another person because it compromises their ability to live a peaceful, serene life that allows them to perfect their intellect. Uh, category number six, laws that mete out punishments to perpetrators, such as the penalty for theft and false witnesses. These laws are designed to disincentivize criminals. This is true mercy to the society who will thereby be freed of violent and ruinous crime. So in in order for society to function properly, there has to be a very strict system of punishment um, and of prison and of penalties that make it clear and, and of capital punishment and of and of corporal punishment that make it clear that society will not tolerate criminality. And that is necessary because if criminality is allowed to run rampant, if people take to the streets and break my windows and do all sorts of mayhem in society, then it's very difficult for the individual to find the peace of mind to perfect his intellect. There's one quote from this section, category six, that I find to be beautiful, just absolutely irresistible. I have to read it for you. It's on page 536 in the Pines edition. The utility of this is clear and manifest, for if a criminal is not punished, injurious acts will not be abolished in any way, and none of those who design aggression will be deterred. And here's the quote. No one is as weak-minded as those who deem that the abolition of punishments would be merciful on men. In other words, those who feel that we have to go soft on criminality, those people who feel that we have to defund the police and that we have to make sure that criminals are given um, a a free pass, there is no one more feeble-minded than that because they are taking their uh, innate compassion that we all possess as human beings and misplacing it on allowing society to run amok Uh, which is the most cruel thing that you can do to society, is to destroy society for the sake of your compassion for criminals. And uh, I just find that to be so apropos of some of the 
the liberal policies that are going on in society today. It's so feeble-minded, it is so short-sighted. And if you really wish for human beings to reach the apex of their humanity, it is perforce necessary to have very, very strict rules within society so that there is a serenity and a peacefulness within society that allows man to achieve their ultimate humanity. Okay, <clears throat> all right. Category number seven, laws of property ownership and transactions, such as loans, wages, buying, selling, inheritance, etc. These property associations are necessary for people in every city. That's the totality of the, what the, the, the book called Sefer Mishpatim, the book of judgments or the book of, yeah, the book of judgments. And the previous category was Sefer Shoftim, right? So these are all whole books. Category number eight covers observance of Sabbath and Yom Tov. The purpose of these is to inculcate certain ideas uh, that will be attained through the observance of the Sabbath to remind ourselves that God is the creator. And it also has the benefit of providing physical rest for our bodies, because if our bodies are not at rest, then we cannot work on our intellect, as we've discussed before. Category number nine are practices of worship applicable to all Jews, such as prayer, Shema. This is all co covered in Sefer Ahava, except for the mitzvah of circumcision, which is not in this category. You'll see why it's shortly. These mitzvot inculcate proper ideas about the love of God and a proper belief in him. Category number 10, setting up the temple, its utensils and ministers, the Kohanim and the Levium, contained in the book of Avodah, the book of book number eight in the, uh, in, in, the, in the Mishnah Torah. We've explained the importance in chapter 32 about limiting the sacrificial service to a specific place. We recall that in chapter 32, the Rambam had said that the whole function of Korbanot was to wean ancient man away from certain idolatrous practices that involved animal sacrifice. And the way that God felt that this was going to be accomplished was through taking those very same practices that were used in pagan worship and using them in the service of God. But because it is not the mainstay of Judaism and it's meant to only pull man away from idolatrous rituals, God limits the application of the laws of Korbanot to specific times and places. And that's all what we discussed in chapter 32. And that's why so much emphasis is placed in the Torah on how to build the temple properly, because the karbanot, the sacrifices, can only be offered in a temple setting. Category 11 are laws of sacrifices contained in Sefer Avodah and Sefer Karbanot. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I just read that. So that Category 11 of the sacrificial order, you'll note the Rambam takes two books from Mishnah Torah and puts them together in this category, again, minimizing the significance of this particular uh, aspect of Jewish ritual by condensing it from two books into one. Category number 12, laws of ritual purity and impurity, which is covered in Sefer Tahara. These laws restrict access and usage of the temple so that it be revered properly. And that the Rambam feels is also very important, that a person has to make sure that temple access is limited for two reasons. Number one, because we have to remember that there is, uh, uh, that it is uh, intellectual perfection can be accomplished anywhere. And therefore, in order to limit access to this very limited sort of um, a portion of mitzvot having to do with the karbanot, there has to be a restriction on how to access the temple. And also, um, it, it, it also has the benefit that the temple is revered sufficiently so that man takes this uh, temple access seriously. And it also helps him with perfecting his intellect to believe that when coming, that when approaching a divine realm, a person has to have a certain level of sobriety and awe and reverence for, the, for that activity. Category number 13, mitzvot that regulate food and drink, which is contained in only a portion of the book, uh, which, which he had called, um, which we had called Kiddusha, uh, sanctification. So half of the book of Kiddusha is devoted to food and drink. Half of it is devoted to sexuality. Notice that the Rambam expands this into two categories. 
Category 13 is the laws of ma'achalot, asirot, forbidden food and drink. Included are the laws of Nazarism, which is a person who takes upon himself a ban on wine. The purpose is to limit a person's lusts for excessive food and drink. And finally, category 14 for the Mora Nevuchim is mitzvot, which limits sexual activity designed to curtail man's lusts in this area. This includes the Sefer Nashim, all about marriage and about divorce. It includes Hilchot Isurei Bia, prohibited uh, sexual relationships. And it also includes laws of prohibited interbreeding of animals and the laws of circumcision, all designed, as we will see when we go through the specific mitzvot, to curtail and to curb man's sexual appetite, including circumcision. And that's why it wasn't included previously with the other laws from the book of Ahava in creating um, practices that help harbor proper moral and uh, mental uh, attitudes. So clearly you see that the 14 categories in the Mishnah Torah are very different from the 14 categories in the Mora. The Rambam clearly acknowledges this. There is no inconsistency in his mind because the Mishnah Torah is one project of telling us how to, how to live our lives as Jews. The Mora Nevuchim is how to approach the mitzvot uh, with having in mind that each and every one of the 613 mitzvot in, is geared towards the perfection of the individual, which will ultimately be done through the perfection of the intellect. The mitzvot, now just the, for the remainder of the chapter, the Rambam states as follows. The mitzvot may be divided into, into two groups. As we know, our sages tell us to do this. There are mitzvot that are ben adam lechavero, and there are mitzvot that are, that are ben adam lamakom. Those terms mean mitzvot that pertain between man and his fellow man, such as the laws of charity, the laws of chesed, the laws of what I'm supposed to do when I damage your property and so forth. And then there are other mitzvot that are ben adam lamakom, between man and his maker. Using our 14 category system in the guide, categories five, six, and seven, and a portion of category three are under the rubric of Bain Adam Lechavero. Now here, what the Rambam is doing is he's basically telling us that only a small percentage of the 14 categories are devoted to Bain Adam Lechavero, man to his fellow man, the majority having to do uh, uh, to develop man's relationship with his creator. And the, why does he say five, six, and seven? So just to review, uh, category five uh, prohibits aggression against others. Category number six uh, meets out the punishments for societal crime. And, and category number seven are laws of transactions. And what does he mean when he says a portion of category three? Those are mitzvot that engender proper moral qualities, what we would call hilchot deot if we were studying Mishnah Torah. Now, if you look at Hilchot Deot, some of them deal with interpersonal relationships, such as a person generating kindness and a feeling of compassion to orphans and widows, and the ban on Lashon Hara, which is the, the latter part of Hilchot Deot, if you want to reference that in the Mishnah Torah. However, other portions of Hilchot Deot deal with proper moral development independent of others, which is the first section, first half of Hilchot Deot. I believe it's the first four chapters of seven chapters of Hilchot Deot deal with how man must develop his moral uh, attitudes and, and, and behaviors not having to do with his in, interpersonal relationships. And it's only the last three chapters that deal with uh, uh, how, these, how his moral character manifests in his interpersonal dealings. So such as uh, in the first part of Hilchot Deot deals with equ equanimity of temperament, moderation and in, in indulgent behavior and so forth and so on, having nothing to do with other human beings. So therefore, really only three and a half of my 14 categories, says the Rambam, deal with aspects of ben adam lechavero. Now, why is that relevant? Why does the Rambam need to point this out? So let's re continue reading. He says, the majority of the categories of mitzvot pertain to the perfection of the human intellect with the objective of the individual attaching and becoming close with God. Now, if you view that that is the primary objective of the mitzvot, which is really what the Rambam is going with in the guide, there are many mitzvot whose objective is to engender a moral quality, an opinion, or a correct behavior, which may ultimately impact other human beings. But they are nevertheless considered bein adam lamakom, 
between man and God, because the primary objective and the more proximal way of, of, uh, uh, of fulfilling the mitzvah is to connect the individual to God. So there may be, for example, in Hilchot Deot, uh, things that the Rambam advocates in order to develop a proper moral character. A person has to be given to civility and to not losing his temper and to controlling certain emotions and emotional responses. Those may ultimately have an impact on other people if I learn how to act like a mensch. But that's not the primary objective of the mitzvah. The primary objective of the mitzvah is that I learn how to control myself for the primary objective, which is to perfect my intellect so that I can conjoin completely and absolutely with God. So therefore, uh, even the mitzvot that seem to be ben adam lachavero, even perhaps in categories five, six, and seven, while they do primarily deal with social interactions and interpersonal behaviors between people, really in keeping in line with the overarching theme of the more, those two are geared towards ultimately the objective of each individual conjoining and becoming close with God. And it appears that the Rambam emphasizes this point, this is just my commentary, in keeping with his thesis that the primary objective of mitzvot is to perfect the individual intellectually so that he can join with God. Thus, even those mitzvot that are ben adam lechavero, such as not stealing and not harming someone's property, are merely a means to that greater end and not an end unto themselves. Now, this again is fascinating, that meaning that if a person were to say, like Rabbi Akiva says, kamocha, love your fellow as yourself, ze klal gadol batorah. This is a such an important principle in the Torah, that if every human being behaves with compassion and sensitivity to another human being, thinking about how I would want to be treated, and I therefore I treat other people that way, that's a beautiful ideal. But remember that for the Rambam, what is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is not that I should be a nice person. The ultimate goal in life is that I should be an intellectually perfected individual, an enlightened individual who understands God and has a complete and perfect knowledge of God and his universe. Now, does that is that person nice or not nice? No, uh, intellectual perfection is nice neutral, I guess you could say. It, that, that, is, that is completely independent of whether or not a person has lived a, night, a life of uh, uh, interpersonal relationships where he is greatly admired and loved by others because of his beautiful and compassionate behavior. And so I just want to say that I am somewhat discomfited by, the, by this Maimonidean approach because I think at the end of the day, there's a part of us all that says, yes, uh, I agree with you, Rambam, that intellectual perfection is so important. But if you're even going to look at the acts of kindness that I do in my life as really a means to a greater end towards that intellectual perfection, it almost takes out the humanity from the humanity. It takes, it takes away what we call the humanity of compassion and sacrifices it for this for the humanity of the of Maimonides, which is the ultimate human being is the intellectually perfected human being. So um, I just want to leave you with that. And then the last thing that the Rambam says is now that I have presented these 14 categories, I will examine each commandment within these categories. I will explain even those mitzvot that seem to have no logical reason, but will present them in keeping with their respective categories. I will only exclude those mitzvot whose purpose I have not grasped. I, there's a typo there that I have not grasped to date. Um, uh, but uh, basically the Rambam says, there are going to be things that I'm going to explain in the ensuing chapters that are described as chukim, as mitzvot that are unintelligible, that are really defy human understanding. I'm going to explain them to you. I'm going to tell, show you how they fit in with the overall project that I've presented to you as what God had in mind when he gave us those, those mitzvot. And the, um, uh, the closing note that I put at the bottom is something that I've already discussed already. So I'm going to stop sharing my, my screen um, so that we can uh, get to some 
discussion, just maybe a minute or two. If anyone has a question or a comment, please feel free to, to chime in at this time. You can unmute yourselves. Um, but um, I don't know whether that, uh, that resonates with you, that sort of this chapter sort of reveals, number one, a contrast between the projects of Mishnah Torah and the project of Moreh Nebuchim, and also this idea that those mitzvot that are ben adam lechavero really are a means to a greater end, having nothing to do with my fellow human being, and somewhat the sort of the, the tension that exists because the Rambam seems almost a little bit um, uh, compassionless uh, in the way that he presents this idea. So anyway, I thought I'd share that with you. Um, and uh, let me wish you a good week. Our next class will just be one more class before Passover next Monday, God willing, and then we'll take a break until after Passover. So have a wonderful week, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.